Breaking the vicious circle of poverty in the Nepal Himalayas. Lessons learned during 20 years of bridging the gap between community development, applied research and investment. As an introduction, I would like to highlight three points. Nepal Himalayas and the faces of poverty. Two key messages I want to bring across to you. The, some background on holistic community development, what we developed and why and how. The second important part of the presentation will be the seven elements that help to break the vicious circle of poverty. 20 years experience boiled down in seven elements and conclusion and que question and answer time. The Nepal Himalayas. Villages and mountains and people. These are the people we want to live and work with. But where is Nepal? Nepal is known for its high mountains, you know, they are the Himalayas, Mount Everest, Kanchenjunga, all these big mountains are there. Many Swiss have been traveling there, climbing mountains, we hear it in the news, but that's not all. The most valuable in Nepal are its people. And here are just some faces. Beautiful are they and special. To the north of Nepal, Big giant China, 1.3 billion. To the south of Nepal, India is 1.2 billion. 70 to 75 per uh, percent of Nepal's 28 million people live in rural areas, with estimated half of them in such remote and difficult to access areas that neither a road nor the national grid will reach them for decades to come. Nepal, just some facts. About 28 million people, nobody really knows how many, 75% in rural areas. Average per head income between 75 and 1800 US dollar. 70% of Nepal's population have no access to electricity. Very low literacy rate in remote areas, not very high in urban. A fast growing gap between the rich and the poor. High unemployment rate, long term unsustainable political government and leadership. But there are good points as well. We have very high hydropower potential. We are very rich in renewable energy resources. We have great sunshine, 300 days sun per day, per, uh, per year, with four and a half to six kilowatt hour per square meter per day, if, if that says anything to you. But it's a great resource. However, what are faces of poverty? For example, all families cook and generate basic indoor lighting on the traditional open fireplace inside their home. That's how it looks like. This is a mother with her children. The living conditions are very dire. Indoor cooking on open fireplaces has a direct chronic impact on the health and the extremely low life expectancy of the women and children in particular, along with devastating deforestation. All the households cook on the three stones with one pot at the time, one dish after the other, rice, lentils and the vegetable dish, often potatoes. That's the reality in our 21st century for thousands of households. And how does the area look like? Did you see any forest? Do you see the women every second day, 50 kilo firewood, up to 40 hours a week? The little child? fell into the, into the open fireplace, burned his whole face. His left arm was so badly burned that he will never be able to use it. Girls, instead of going to schools, are sent to collect firewood and water collection and so on. Hygienic conditions, terrible. Can't we do better? Yes, we can. Poverty has many faces and definitions and cannot easily be defined in mere economic values and figures as different standards, ethics and expressions of what poverty means are held in different cultures. But what poverty does do, independent of national borders, so is manifest itself in the inability to meet human needs such as food, shelter, work, clothes, clean water, fuel, healthcare and education. It denies human beings the chances to live dignified lives, 
with choices and opportunities for change and development. So the first key message I would like you to take home is we er er eradicated two or no, we uh, summarized seven elements that help to break the vicious circle of poverty. A summary of 20 years summarized in seven elements. What are the seven, seven elements? We will look later on in much more greater detail, one after the other. The first one is preventative health care. The second, highly contextualized solutions to problems identified. A close community involvement is absolutely necessary. Renewable energy resources and renewable energy technologies are at the center of community development. Seeds for ongoing development, long-term project partnership, between the different stakeholders and identify and share best practices with each other and that on a national and international basis. And all these seven elements are interconnected with each other as well and therefore synergistic benefits will be great. First key message, the seven elements that help to break the vicious circle of poverty. The key message number two, I would like you to take home is we need someone building bridges and partnerships between all project stakeholders, between the local community, research and development partners, local and international industry partners, educational partners and very important between the donors and impact investors in a very active and lively way. These two key messages I want to come back at the very end and I hope if you only take these two messages home, I'm happy. Let's start with key message two. We need bridge builders. And Ritz Nepal and Ritz Switzerland wants to be such a bridge builder. What does it stand for, Ritz Nepal? It stands for Rural Integrated Development Services. And of course, as we have been Nepal in Nepal, it has a Nepali name. Gramin Ekikrit Bikash Seva Nepal is exactly the same, Rural Integrated Development Services. And we are established in the year 2062. That's not a printing mistake, that's the Nepali year. They are 57 years, eight months ahead of us. So that was 2005, the legal registration, and we founded Ritz Nepal in 2002. Ritz Nepal and Ritz Switzerland build partnerships with local communities in project design, project implementation, project follow-up, and in particular, we coordinate very actively with uh, research and development partners, local and international industrial partners, educational partners, donors, and impact investors. In particular, partnership with donors and Funding sources are very crucial and need to be interactive. Partnership with donors and impact investors, which enable to identify us, the local development needs only. They allow us only to implement mutually agreed project solutions. They create opportunities and long-term impact. Support individuals, charities and philanthropic organizations in making efficient use of their valuable funds dedicated to projects. Okay, who is this bridge, this Ritz Nepal and Ritz Switzerland? What is its vision and its mission? Our Ritz Nepal and Ritz Switzerland are both organizations, non-government organizations, we call them NGOs, founded in Nepal and in Switzerland in 2002 and 2013 respectively. Both NGOs are non-profit organizations involved in long-term holistic community development projects and field-based research projects supported by individuals, charities and organizations. Our vision, our vision is to improve Nepal's remote, poor mountain communities' overall quality and standard of life. And our mission is through the implementation of long-term holistic community development programs planned, designed, realized and followed up in joint partnership with the local communities within their life's context. 
Special focus is given to the poor, marginalized and disadvantaged people and community groups in remote, difficult to reach mountain communities in the Nepal Himalayas. Let's look at Nepal in its own context. Ritz Nepal's holistic community development projects are implemented in two of the poorest and remotest districts of Nepal in Humla and Jumla. Kathmandu is the capital and usually we have to go by road to Nepal Ganj and then we fly from Nepal Ganj to Humla and then I usually walk from Humla to Jumla and these are the two areas we work here in presently five villages and here presently in six villages. The holistic community development approach developed and applied by Ritz Nepal since 1996. It is based on practical community development experience of almost 20 years and two concepts have come up from it and we implement in two stages, the so-called family of four and the family of four plus. Our 20 years experience in the field shows that communities themselves identify a pit latrine for their family, a smokeless metal stove inside their home, basic indoor lighting in their home and access to clean and sufficient drinking water in the village. Most of the time as the four main needs they want to address for their family and with their local community. Therefore, Let's call them all together. Thus, the basic issues to address in a holistic community development project is the family of four. A pit latrine, always first. A smokeless metal stove, always second. Basic indoor lighting, third. And access to clean drinking water, the fourth pillar of the family of four. Once the family of four is implemented, which usually takes two years for a normal average village of maybe 30 to 40 households, people's life get much quicker, better, healthier, more interesting for themselves. And all of a sudden they say, we have more other needs. We are, what? we are hungry. Therefore, we developed various other technologies such as greenhouses, solar dryers, hot bathing centers through solar water, heated solar cookers, non-formal education, slow sand water filter in the house, malnutrition program and scholarships for young men and women. And as the presentation goes on, I will share with you in greater detail what we mean and do in these various projects. With the family of four and the family of four plus approach, we have created projects component that both stand alone and especially in combination bring forth long-term synergistic benefits, energize villagers' faith in and enthusiasm for making changes in their village as a whole. The seven elements that help break the vicious circle of poverty. Now, message Key message one. Key message two, build bridges. Ritz Nepal, Ritz Switzerland wants to be that bridge. Key message one, the seven elements to help break the vicious circle of poverty. First element, preventative health care. Preventative health care, a big word, what does it mean? Yes, we need to improve in overall hygiene. Fecal oral infections are very, very common because there are no toilets. Basic indoor lighting is important to fight indoor air pollution from open fireplaces. And accidents where children fall into the fire like the little boy we saw in a previous slide. Malnutrition of small children is enormous and nobody has fresh, fresh and uh, sufficient drinking water in their village. 4.3 million people a year die prematurely from illness attributable to household air pollution caused by the inefficient use of solid fuels. These are the data from 2012 from the World Health Organization. In the high altitude remote mountain places such as Humla and Jumla, we cook in open fireplaces as you can see here and people use the so-called jarro as lamps and we cook on open fireplaces 
such as here. And here is the face of a woman. You can't see it. It's full of smoke. How healthy can that be? Here we measure carbon monoxide and as you can see here, 60 parts per million alarm is ringing frantically. She continues to cook for hours at a time. She is pregnant all the time. What happens to the fetus and to the unborn child? Here we measure particle matters with an indoor air pollution uh, measurement. We can ve measure various particle matters, 2.5, 10 and total suspended particles. Here in our office in Simicot, one of the smokeless stoves I designed in the 90s, the smoke is gone. Again, we measure particle matters, we measure carbon monoxide and things look differently. Staggering differently. How different? We measure and we take data. Here in a house without a stove, here in our office with a stove. And we plot 24 hour plots so that we understand the pattern how people live and how they cook and when they cook. The red curve is the house in a local house with a stove, the blue curve is in a house with no stove. You can see in the night we sleep, all in the early morning we get up, we cook tea to get warm because it's cold and it spikes because huge pollution happens. Then people go into the field, they come back for a short tea break and then in the evening they start cooking again, sit around the fire. Then you say the red and the blue lines are almost the same. Yes, clear here the blue is much higher. However, here goes up to 50 milligram per cubic meter, here goes to 5. Just a technology designed for a particular context. Right away, if you call these graphs to be the same, is right away 10, 10 times better to start with. Now you train these people how to use it properly, it's 20 times better. And who is the winner? The unborn baby in particular and the women. So why develop a million dollar program for mentally retarded children once they are born instead of a hundred dollar uh, stove installed in a home and people have a much more dignified life and these children can grow up in a much more hygienic condition. But as you can see, we do not have it yet. There's a lot of work left. There's a lot of work left. Children are malnourished. Sometimes they don't even have clothes or shoes and walk in snow. Flies are all over. They don't even swap them away. It, they are just too frequently uh, seen. Therefore, malnutrition is widely, widely spread and we have started many, many years back for the 10 most malnourished children in every village we work, we started a program. We have two staff trained in malnourishment and the 10 worst nourished children and their mothers are on a periodical program for years. And as you can see here, one of our staff teaches the women what to cook with the local grown food. That's locally grown food and we teach them how to cook, what to cook, how to breastfeed. And then we measure every child, every month we measure every child and we weigh every child. We meet every week with mothers, we discuss with every week with mothers how to do better, how to read the, uh, the weight and the arm circumference. We weigh the child and the mother has to look. We show them, of course, very difficult for them to understand curves, but over the years, slowly, slowly, they see their child is improving. Like this child, when it, we picked it up, this is, the, this is the malnourished curve of a child from zero to five years of age. This is the World Health Organization graph. A child should be from birth to, to five years of age. This child we picked up here. It would have 100% died if that child would have not been taken up on program. And after two and a half years or so, it finally hit the curve. It survived. Was it not all worth? It was, even for one child. Second element, highly contextualized solution. Now, we engineers, now we come really at the forefront and our hearts just beat more. Look, these areas. 
And look, some of examples I developed over the last 20 years, some of the contextualized technical solutions, such as a smokeless metal stove for a defined people group in a set geographical and cultural context, solar photovoltaic system designed according to the user's habits and electricity demands, slow sand water filter for storage and consumption of clean water inside the home, pico hydropower plant without cement, high altitude greenhouse, and a solar water heated community bathing center. And I want to show you to each one just a few slides. Here is that stove I designed by hand. We had no AutoCAD at that time. Here is the company where I taught many, many people how to do that stove with local material, local skills, so that local people can earn a living and they can feed their families. We even trained people in the high altitude how to make the exhaust pipes because they are easy to manufacture. These stoves are manufactured in a city down at the Indian border in Nepal Ganj where you saw and then they are shipped up and here the happy farmers come and carry them into their home. They have to pay 2500 rupees, Nepali rupees, which is about 25 Swiss franc in today's currency. They have maybe sold a cow, they have sold a piece of land, but they have understood, I need that for me and my family. Here we teach them how to install the stove. And now, before it looked how, do you remember? And now it looks like that. Isn't it better? It cooks the local traditional food all in one the way they like it, with up to 40% less firewood. And the children, they don't fall into the fire. Well, it's hot at times, but they don't burn themselves anymore like in previous time. And it has hot water to wash the hands after the toilet. And all the time in that stainless water tank is 9 liter hot water because we drink Tibetan tea all day long. So why use a gun firewood and you can adjust the airflow here and the damper here so that you have much higher combustion efficiency. That's where the engineering skills come in, where I and my friends here, we learn the basics here. For whom? For them. And in the night we sit around here, here, that's the Tibetan tea. We just brew it new and in this uh, uh, aluminum can we put it then. And here the child walks around, doesn't get burned anymore and learns very quick, oops, that's hot. It learns very quick. And I have the privilege to see that. Another contextualized solution is solar PV systems to provide basic indoor lighting for different households, for cluster households and for whole villages. Dependent on and, and therefore designed according to the end user's context. So, why different? Because sometimes we have single houses, so we have a single home solar PV system such as here. And then we have sometimes houses built together very closely, so up to 10 households can have a cluster system all combined with underground cable with an 80 watt solar PV panel. And sometimes houses are very closely built into each other and you can see from some of the pictures how they are built and then we build a two axis tracking solar PV system all developed at the university I was working for 11 years and manufactured in Nepal by Nepali hands and generating 30 to 35 percent more power because it tracks the sun every day from east to west. Not just a panel for every house, for every village is saying, no, we have to understand the culture, the context and then we start to design. That's what contextualized technology needs to be. So from previously dark, dark smoke-filled uh, rooms, people use now small white LED lights powered by electricity. What a difference. And if they have basic indoor lighting, they have a stove. And if they have a stove, they have a pit latrine. Without a pit latrine, no stove. And without no stove, no lights. That's how it goes with Ritz Nepal. And in 10 years, well, finally he passes his exams. And then who doesn't want to see smiling faces when you saw before so sad faces? And children, they are still dirty, but they look already much cleaner because sometimes they say, oops, I can see the dirt in my house now. And this is not even a made picture. I came into this house and they were studying under a one watt light. How beautiful is that? I get goosebumps. That's my salary has been the last 20 years. That's how it was before. That's how it's now. 
And I know this lady since 15 years. I meet her every time, and in about three weeks, I will see her again. And 15, ye 15 years ago, I thought she died, dies very soon. She's still around. Last May, she was still around. Unbelievable. But she has now light. That was before. She has a stove. She has access to drinking water. She has a pit latrine. Slow stand water filter. It's not sure that the tap stand in the village provides clean drinking water throughout the season. It's not true. Most organizations think so. So I developed this slow sand water filter which can be used in the house. And we measure the quality of fecal, fecal E. coli and so on to make sure that it's proper. We teach them how to install. That's one of our staff. We teach them they have to bring their own sand. They have to clean the sand. They have to carry the sand. There is in every project they have to participate, sometimes financially, sometimes financially and participatory work. At, but it's never a taking and giving thing. Here I talked about the Pico without any cements in seven years. This is the one we built, a Pico hydropower plant with no cement running for seven years. It broke down one and a half years ago because people uh, fiddled around the local people with the wires and switched them over because they have no idea and the motor burned out. Two people who are sitting, no, one person sits here in particular, has given a great, a great uh, financial contribution and uh, has enabled us now to design it and improve it. Again, you, when I go up now uh, in two weeks time, I hope that we I can take everything with me and we install it again. Seven years without any problems running. Why no cement? Because where we bought the cement and where we used, would have used the cement, the cement would have been 13 times the price in a community which is 20 times poorer than where we buy the cement. There is not even a reason to talk about sustainability if you have factors such as this. And unfortunately, that is the done thing with DETSA, with USID, with, with, with all the big organizations. That's the done thing. Greenhouses, high altitude greenhouses. Till, till recently, till before 2004, we had only three to four months maximum vegetables. The rest, we had no vegetables. You know what that means? Then I started to build the first high altitude greenhouse with, with huge thermal mass, 60 centimeter wide, stones all available, mud and stone available, wood available, and only UV stabilized plastic I bring from the city. And now they are built by the hundreds. Ten years after, last year the first time, now I see them really popping up like mushrooms. Ten months they grow now, green vegetables. And now it looks like that when outside is snow. You know what that means for the little children who grow up now? They want to learn more, so they need more education. Solar is abundant there. We are in the solar belt, 30 degree northern latitude at high altitude. I utilize the solar energy to build bathing center for improved hygiene. People never wash. At the warmest season, the water has 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Have you washed your hair once at 10 to 12 degrees Celsius? Well, the few cells left, they also go. I tell you, I've tried it many times. I don't wash. So we have designed that as another Kathmandu University research project with students and all manufactured in Nepal. Well, it has only 45% efficiency compared to a Swiss one, maybe 75% efficiency, but it provides hot water, provides work, gives a company new product. And I have built now the first two in the world, I guess, even high altitude bathing centers for whole communities. And they can come every week, they can have a wash every week before maybe every three, four months. Number three, unless there is a close community interaction and participation and involvement, we can't do anything and we shouldn't do anything. Because at the end of the day, they themselves have to identify their own felt needs. Therefore, we create the so-called PIC committees, project implementation committee in every village for every project. And we meet frequently. These are our three staff and these are the local people. And I always participate and here I go and take pictures. I enjoy these times best. And I have trained now or have been had the privilege to train some of them 18 years. And I don't need to sit there. It's like a holiday. I can go and take pictures, can listen how they do it. And it's marvelous. And they all participate. They get eager for it. 
But before we even turn one stone in the village, we do an initial baseline survey with 56 questions, which gives us like a present shot of the actual village. Not just how many people, but as well, are there, are there, is this a monogamous or a polygamous or a, a polyandry uh, group? Because we have polyandry, so uh, one woman has up to six, seven, eight husbands. That we have as well. So we need to understand that because that's a complete different culture. And once the family of four is implemented in the village, which is two to three years, we do a follow-up survey, usually after two to three years, with another 52 questions to find out what has changed, what do they say has changed, and how should we go ahead in a partnership. And that's how we get the data. NFE stands for Non-Formal Education. Another program we find very important, if there is great health, pit latrine, stove, indoor lighting, people start to say, I would like to read and write. The little girls, did you see the work they do? Carrying wood, looking after the goats, carrying water from the river, usually dirty. They don't have the chance to go to school. So we have created for illiterate women. In our area, 4.8% of the women can write their own name, close to no one. And girls who never had the privilege to go to school, we have started so-called non-formal education classes. And they go for up to two years. And we have developed our own curriculum, which they have participated actively in it. And how could it be? What are the topics? Of course, the family of four. Toilet, stove, basic indoor lighting, access to clean drinking water. This is Maile Kokalam and this is Suki Barivar one two and three, we have three books, Suki Barivar means healthy family. A healthy family is if we have the family of four installed. So we developed the educational program based on their culture, based on the programs they participate in, and we have not bought the books in Kathmandu where they have cement houses and cars, because they live 10 days walk from the next roadhead. They have never seen a car or a bicycle, so it's, it makes no sense. And that's how a book, one of these various books we developed, looks like. And we have two dedicated staff in our Ritz Nepal. And these are local trained educators who are from the village and who run the classes six times a week in the evening up to two hours. And we have every month's monthly meeting where they have to come with the students' lists, what they have achieved, what they have done, the exams, and what prizes they gave, and so on. Look this small little room. They all hatch there inside and they, they enjoy it. And often after two years, the, after two years, the Family of Four project is implemented. The local community start to realize and identify the need for more life-changing opportunities through additional projects we call the Family of Four Plus, such as the non-formal education, which is one of the Family of Four Plus projects. Renewable energy, resources and technology the fourth element of the seven elements. Renewable energy, improved access to basic energy services are central and crucial for improved living conditions and thus are the center of holistic community development. So we have like solar photovoltaic, as I shared, we have, for example, small wind turbine, as you can see here, and here we measure at four and a half thousand meter altitude the wind speed, where we have only 70% of the atmospheric pressure and therefore as well much less air. So, but let's understand the resources we have. Unless you know your resources, you don't know how to design systems. So we measure sources at horizontal 30 degree and two axis tracking frame of how much watt per square meter per day we receive. And then we design the solar PV system according to the particular context. Then we make a knowledgeable decision how big a size of a solar PV system can be and therefore the likeliness of a solar PV system to last much longer is greater. It's never perfect, it's never guaranteed, but it's greater. Here we have various pyranometers. Pyranometers measure the intercepted solar radiation, watt per square meter or kilowatt per square meter here. And then we know the resources and can calculate the solar PV systems. Wind is a very interesting uh, technology, not per se Nepal is a wind country, but we have so many valleys that natural venturi effects sometimes help amazingly to speed up the wind and we can tap into that. 
utilize what is available. Water, as I mentioned in a previous slide, is the most abundant. Water is the gold of Nepal. And here, again, an insight into the seven-year-old without cement built by Pico Hydro. 600 watt for 73 households, all households underground wired. And the village is a kilometer away from here. Has been running seven years. 600 watt. It's half of your toaster at home. <laughs> High altitude greenhouse, here you can see the greenhouse from another side. We can open it here at the bottom, at the top, to, lead, to let the hot air out during the day. And look now, 10 years ago, there was nothing. Look, every single house has now one in that particular village. Here. Outside is nothing, look inside. And here I call them the sausages. Each sausage has 80 liter here. We we collect thermal energy and in the night we radiate energy out again and small uh, tomatoes and stuff like that can grow. And you can see here I measure temperature, humidity, I measure temperature down to the ground two meters to understand things. That's what science is all about. We have to understand. God has given us that wisdom to understand, so we should. And then we design and look now. They have never seen cauliflower there. That's wonderful. These are the villages. That's where we live. And now the vegetable is so plentiful at certain time that we have too much, so we dry them. So I developed, again, as a student research project at the Kathmandu University solar dryer, which the government again subsidizes, like the smokeless metal stove. The government of Nepal subsidizes it with 4,000 rupees, 50,000 stoves a year. How wonderful is that? Solar, again, when there is enough solar energy, we can cook with solar cookers. However, for single families, very difficult. But for offices, NGOs, police, armies, a good technology to start. Why? Maybe we can talk that later on. And here, the solar bathing center, that was the very first one installed in 2004. That is 11 years running non-stop every day now. And every day about 20 people come and have a shower here. Seeds for ongoing development. Well, he just enjoys the better living condition. She is the future. And for her, we need to cater. And therefore, we have included scholarships for the Karnali Technical School. This is the most remote technical school in Nepal. At that time, when I took the picture, seven days walk from the next road. Now a small mud road comes up and several months of the year we can drive. I have been working here in this school. Our organization has been building this school from 1979 onwards till 1995. I have been working here since now from 96 till 2000 as well, educating young Nepali women and men. We have had the privilege over the last now 13 years to have 19 students from Humla and, nine, uh, and Jumla sent to this school for a two and a half years training in agriculture, in midwifery, in nutrition, and uh, in other health and veterinary related education. This so that they in the future can apply the family of four and extend it. So we will be one day not needed anymore. They can install and design solar at micro hydro power plant. They can build and maintain drinking water systems to keep the water clean so that the children can not only play but can wash their faces and the flies will not sit anymore on them. They should be the teachers, like he. He's a local one, chosen by the village community, the PIC, the Project Implementation Committee, and he teaches it. And that we can, or they can, generate more income through growing apple trees and selling apple tree, apples on the market. Long-term project partnerships are very, very crucial and important part of our work. Making a profound change through long-term project partnerships with village communities and supporting donor agencies. I want to give you a practical example we just experienced. The growing trust and project partnership with the Swiss Foundation Symphasis since 2010 enabled recently a three-year holistic community development project with three villages in Jumla to start in 2013 and it will finish officially in 2016. 
Let me talk a little bit more in greater detail. Symphasis is the philanthropic arm from Credit Suisse. It has an own dedicated website. Ritz Nepal's and Ritz Switzerland's present three years holistic community development program in Joomla is the third partnership with Symphasis. The first one was a solar PV wind turbine hybrid system. And that project actually was from June 2010 till, till December 2012, officially finished. The second was a village drinking water system in two villages, also from January 2011 till December 2012. And the third one has started in August 2013 and runs till July 2016. Now let's look at the first one in 2010 to 2012. That's a solar PV system and a wind turbine. We hybridize these two technologies and we measure all these technologies data logging, this is a data logger, every 15 seconds the data is logged and then averaged and you can download it or can present it and look the performance of that system on the internet, on our website. Here I took from January, January 25th, 2015 to 28th, January 2015, three years after the project finished almost, or two and a half years after the project finished, the donor didn't ask for any report and is still running, up and running, providing data for students, for researchers, for lecturing in colleges such as this. Four and a half years after the project have started, things are still running because we are looking after it. Another example, Symphasis funded two village drinking water systems for villagers in 2012 and here pictures I took in 2014. Here we just finished building it in 2012 and here in 2014 when I went in April last year uh, I saw the same village, it's, it's still running beautifully every day so many times they come and fetch water clean and close to their homes. Here again in another village uh, in Humla five drinking water tap stands we built just finished in 2012 and here in 2014 I visited it again uh, and, and beautifully it runs exactly the same and they just enjoy it. Here other drinking water tap stands in the same village in Humla in Yangu village in 2012 just finished and here in April 2014, after the follow-up program we run, and I will be going there again now in about three, four weeks' time, I will be there again. A little more sad story from the implementation point of view of the government, but a fantastic, good example from our donor relationship is the Triveni 45 kilowatt micro hydropower plant, which was built by the Nepali government. They just didn't put the overflow in. And what happened? The villagers started to run. Do you see that? That was all soil. They planted their crop on it. In three weeks' time, huge erosion. All the soil was gone. Budget was eaten up. I checked the drawings. I found the drawings. And in the drawings, the overflow was there. Money was just gone. So they stopped, the, of course, the microhydro, and six villages just don't have electricity. And one of our three villages, the Symphasis program presently running, is part of the six villages. And our commitment is indoor lighting. But we can't put solar if they have a microhydro. That doesn't make sense. So I looked at it in April, and we, we collaborated with each other, and I talked to Symphasis and decided and proposed a 400 millimeter overflow pipe which Symphasis was not, uh, it was not in our budget, but Symphasis understood the context and the urgent need, and they allowed us to reallocate the budget for this, and we just built it in October till end of December, and now since January 2015, two months ago, the water is flowing. All that land is gone forever, valuable land, which is already very sparingly there, but at least the, the power plant is running and all six villages and I got, just got an email today morning, the villages have now daily light. Here an example how we built, that's not finished, we will cover that all, so that was taken in December. You can see with, with uh, stones again, we, we put metal netting around and we will cover them all with soil here and that's all participatory work of the villagers. Identify and share best practices. Multiplying the impact of holistic community development projects 
through ongoing learning from implemented projects, ongoing learning from recorded performance data, as we have seen in various plots, sharing best practices with researchers, development workers, through conferences and workshops, helping students to bridge the gap between theory and reality through hands-on research and student projects, systematically develop educational programs, including modules for practical experience and best practices, and providing new interactive educational courses through modern communication media and channels, such as our di uh, digital new world. So, I've been working since 11 years at the Kathmandu University. How do we integrate such an institution and training centre? How can academic institutions be actively involved and participate in changing people's living conditions? For example, in creating relevant courses. These are this is a master degree course I have developed in nine chapters, chapter one to one to nine with different topics, environmental impact assessment, the renewable energy system design, and so on and so on and so on. And that will be taught in a two years master's degree course. And as you can see from the pictures, there even some pictures are the same. They are from Nepal and not from an American uh, book, which theories only, but with hands-on practical issues. Here, my own book, that was my dissertation, uh, is not a groundbreaking research project and I made my PhD not in a new, I don't know what, small uh, field, but my last 20 years of experience I put together in a book which can be used now as a textbook for people who would like to know about contextualized technologies, about holistic community development and would like to put things in place. What have we done wrong, what we have done better and how can we uh, learn from each other and not reinvent the wheel again and again. Through relevant classroom teaching, where we should include in a country such as Nepal also topics such as a smokeless metal stove, such as village drinking water systems, such as rural village electrification, off-grid usually, such as pit latrine, such as community development or community health, non-formal education. Classroom teaching is very important. We have to do it interactively. Here I brought, brought, brought our program manager from Humla to teach our bachelor students a class. He had a class 10 degree. They were bachelors. So he couldn't really hold an academic degree as they are about to get, but he had 20 years practical experience. So he has valuable experience to share. Important is students have to put hands on uh, something to work. Like here, master degree students who work on a maximum PowerPoint tracker developed in Nepal and measure with solar radiation what that solar PV system really generates. Or like here, some of my students in one of the restaurants near a road, four hours from Kathmandu since 2005, I have installed that stove we measure here, the temperature we measure here, the degradation of the, of the metal, and in January 15, that stove had 60,000 hours cooking hours, and it's still there. And I will see it in three week, two weeks, actually, again. <laughs> Some examples of appropriate and relevant student research projects installed in the local communities for a context such as in Nepal. For example, solar PV tracking, self-tracking frames. At that time, solar panels were very expensive, now they are not. But that time was good. Sem or a smokeless metal stove, we can still improve. There is never an end. Solar dryer was one of the student research projects. Solar water heaters are a student research project. And for what do we do that? All for the next generation. And for the present generation, of course, as well. We could organize funds from 2003 to 2009 to have Kathmandu University run project with 16 graduates learn at the side of experienced professors. How valuable is that? Each, student, each graduate at least for two years. In these ways, through projects, through working along with professors, we can prepare an enthusiastic, qualified and responsible new generation of citizens with a vision, passion and a heart for people. Okay, institutions, academic institutions, organizations, donor groups, 
philanthropic groups and young people. We want to educate and prepare for the next generation. We have villages with their problems. People in their own cultures, they have needs, self-identified needs. And who is bridging the gap? How do we bridge the gap? Key message number two, we need organization and people. Ritz Nepal and Ritz Switzerland wants to be such a bridge gapper. Between academia, organizations, donors, philanthropic organizations and the ones who have no voice yet. And for example, with our high altitude research station, you see here, that's our office. The first greenhouse built in 2004, first bathing center, first tracker system, first solar dryer, first high altitude solar water heater, all here. First two, hour, two years tested and once the mistakes er found out and improved, only then they go into the village. Also other tools, we have an internet website, please check them out. I made great effort to extend this website again and again. We have Ritz Switzerland, also website in English and in German. And we have even project specific websites such as this website. I had a five year project with SUPSI from Lugano, Fachhochschule uh, in SUPSI in Lugano. And very successful, still online, that project. What's the conclusion? After 20 years, I have er uh, come up with seven elements that help break the vicious circle of poverty. Preventative healthcare, high contextualized solution, close community involvement, renewable energy, technology and resource, seeds for ongoing development, long-term project partnerships, identify and share best practices. The seven elements are interactive and built together with each other for synergistic long-term benefits. And then, we can say responsibly, they have more opportunities, they have more chances, and then we see as well more smiles. And they are worth it. And I would like with that slide to say, let's maybe move over to the Q&A session. And I want to thank you for your attention and interest. And of course, if you want to know more, you can contact me for any further information, be it practical advice for projects, for communities, for donations you know of someone or want to provide for particular projects, partnership for education, voluntary work and so on. And new ideas especially and hands who are willing to put their hands to the bolts and nuts we need. Thank you.